Good afternoon everybody, Dr Nick Coatesworth with today's top three and I'm very pleased to have uh, my boss, the Acting Chief Medical Officer of Australia, Professor Paul Kelly with me for today's top three. Welcome Paul. Thanks Nick. And uh, I just wanted to shout out, the both of us wanted to shout out to West Australians as uh, two young lads we grew up in WA, uh, sort of mixed in the same circle south of the river, I think, a, a decade or so apart, of course. And uh, I am a West Coast Eagle supporter, and Paul, you're a... I'm a Docker supporter, which really explains the whole, my, my whole rationale through this entire epidemic, which is prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And that's, <laughs> that sums up being a Docker supporter, really. Well, that's, uh, that's a great comment that I'm going to pass to my father-in-law, who is um, also occasionally a Docker supporter, but only when the Eagles aren't playing. Now, we've, we've got the opportunity now to hear uh, from the top of Australia's um, pandemic response. So we've collected some of the questions that uh, you have uh, put at the forefront of, of responses to top three. But perhaps the first one I just wanted to ask Paul was, how, how's your background in epidemiology uh, helped you craft the response to the pandemic? Uh, well, firstly, I'd say uh, there's been a huge team of people that have been working on the response, and uh, I've been really privileged to be part of that. Uh, I, someone said to me recently that, that it was like uh, my whole career had led to this moment, and in a way it has. Uh, epidemiology, uh, I studied um, early in my career, uh, my interest in infectious diseases, my experience in disasters, uh, particularly in East Timor in, in 1999. 2000. These were all part of, of what I'm using, the sk those skills and experience that I've, I've gained over the years um, in relation to this. Uh, so that, that's absolutely been fundamental. I have a, a skill from epidemiology in particular uh, of being able to see a, a graph on a page and know pretty much what's going on. And so that's being a, able to quickly interpret uh, issues and that's an epidemiological skill that I've picked up over the years and so when we see for example what's happening in Victoria right now and, and, and thinking through what the implications are and where it may be leading to that's that's what epidemiologists do um, making those disease detective links between various elements of society and what might be happening there is another skill so so I've certainly uh, bring that to the table and I'm not alone in those those skills it's great to uh, that people are starting to understand uh, geeky terms like flatten the curve and the difference between aerosol and do droplet transmission, um, all of these things that are second nature to epidemiologists, especially in infectious diseases. Uh, and so I'm able to have conversations with my, with my relatives who up until now thought epidemiology was a subset of dermatology, <laughs> just dealing with the epidermis at the top of the skin. <laughs> well, that's perfect. And certainly from my um, perspective, ever since I've been involved in the um, Commonwealth uh, space back through my role in the National Trauma Centre uh, starting in, in 2012, Paul's been a feature um, of Australia's epidemiological landscape and, and, and well before then. And, and we do have an amazing cadre, I think, Paul, of um, very skilled sort of not not just technical but also operational and academic people such as yourself both within the health department and and in the states and territories uh yes and it is uh, extraordinary to uh, work with those people some of those i've known for many years and others i've only met recently um, uh, Australians are very lucky to have had such a, uh, a wealth of training in this area over, over many years. Uh, some years ago I was the head of the Master of Applied Epidemiology program, uh, one of a, uh, a network of, of field epidemiology training programs around the world that are based on the CDC in Atlanta um, uh, Epidemic Intelligence Service program that's been running for many, many years. So, uh, so that, that's great that we've got those people and they keep popping up and we've, we've got several of them working with us here in the Commonwealth, others in the States and, uh, and even internationally. Uh, so that's a great network to be part of. Fantastic. So let's get into the nitty gritty and, and uh, maybe some of the thorny questions because this has come up for Paul and I a lot uh, since the pandemic began. Would you recommend people use masks in the current environment? Uh, well, that is a, a, a very uh, interesting question and one that uh, we're asked at almost every uh, press conference that uh, Nick and I have done and, and others, Michael and so on, uh, over the, the last few months. Um, 
So like any good epidemiologist, I would, uh, I would put the caveat of it depends. Uh, so obviously for people in Melbourne right now, it's actually mandated that you wear masks when you go outside on the street. So my opinion on that is, is, is somewhat irrelevant. But if I was in Melbourne, uh, even if it wasn't mandated, I would certainly be considering wearing a mask right now. And why is that? Uh, it certainly can give some protection to an individual. It can also protect the rest of the community by decreasing the, the transmission from person to person. Uh, and in a place like Melbourne at the moment with widespread community transmission, that is certainly part of the, of the way of, of dealing with that issue, both for personal protection and to decrease that transmission around. Uh, so that's, that's one, one area in, in, in people going about their business in Melbourne. Um, of course, in healthcare settings, absolutely vital to have, have uh, good PPE, um, including the, the correct masks, uh, and that's absolutely vital for our healthcare workers, our aged care workers, and others that aren't able to keep that physical distance easily uh, and are in difficult situations and caring in particular with people who are known to be infected. Let's think about outside of Melbourne now. The rest of Australia, even though we've seen some cases in, in recent uh, uh, weeks in New South Wales, in South Australia and Queensland, all of those related to the, to the Victorian um, issue. Um, really, for most places in those states, the, the community transmission is still remaining extremely low. So the risk of transmission to an individual is quite low. Uh, but even there, so in some parts of New South Wales, in certain circumstances in those other states, I would certainly consider wearing a mask, for example, if I was in a crowded train, uh, unable to keep my physical distance, or in a place where, where it was just difficult to do those other, the famous uh, Nick do the three. Um, uh, th those are still the key elements. And I would say, as my final remark on masks, it is not a silver bullet. Uh, masks can help, uh, they, can, they are very, good physical reminder that there is an issue and people are reminded that, that, uh, that that's the case. Uh, it's certainly someone that, that people can feel they're doing something for themselves uh, and, and as a contribution to decrease that transmission. So all those things are good, but they are not the only thing. You must continue to wash your hands. You must continue that cough etiquette. If you're sick, stay at home and get tested if that's the case. And, and the other thing that I've heard, uh, Paul, particularly down in in Melbourne is that whilst the, the masks are absolutely mandated and you need to wear them uh, when you're going outside and, and indoors interacting with strangers, but um, what about the properly using the mask issue? I mean, I've, I've seen in, in clinical practice, unfortunately, people sort of coming off with a mask on from either the operating theatre or somewhere like that. This is pre-COVID, of course, but sort of hanging it down on the chin and, and, and having lunch and then popping it back up again. So we need to also tell everybody that we have to use it properly. Absolutely, Nick, and, and a, a poorly used mask can be dangerous, actually. Um, so I'm not underestimating that as an issue. Um, the, why, why do masks work uh, to protect an individual is because they, they, they when properly fitted and used, um, do protect um, uh, the droplet infection, uh, or for some masks even aerosolised infection, uh, that can, can be a problem with COVID-19. Um, However, the way that they do that is by filtering out the air. And so if, if you're touching the mask, uh, if you're reusing the mask, if you're using it for too long, if it's wet, uh, all of these things make, them, make it ineffective and therefore um, can be either dangerous or not um, particularly effective uh, for, the, for the, uh, what, what it's trying to achieve. So all of these things are very important. I've seen those things as well. Nick, I was in a pharmacy here in, in, uh, in Canberra, actually, uh, in, the, in the last few days. Everyone wearing masks uh, as a protection for the staff, uh, having a lot of interaction with a lot of people and potentially people that are sick. Um, so that, that, that's their experience and they want to do that. But I saw uh, someone with a mask on their head, someone with a mask not covering the nose, someone with a mask underneath their chin, they don't work like that. 
very, very important message to, to wear those masks, but just make sure you avail yourself of all the resources that we've got on the health.gov.au website and in your local, uh, local state or territory, uh, many of which now, particularly New South Wales and Victoria, have very good guidance on how to put on a mask. Now, the last question is, is one I'm glad it's come up actually because it's one that my wife and I struggle with a, a fair bit. Um, should children be tested every time they come home from school with a sniffle? So I'll start with a really good story here, Nick. That, so that's, uh, that's that our flu season that we're usually struggling with at this time of year and causing, uh, let's face it, a lot of uh, issues, including with our elderly people, like we're seeing you know, very unfortunately and tragically in Melbourne right now in aged care. Um, we often get very large flu outbreaks in aged care and throughout the community at this time of year. We haven't had any. Uh, now, I can't say that for, for sure we're not going to have a flu season this year, um, but so far, since April, since those first uh, lockdown um, uh, restrictions that happened uh, all throughout Australia, plus probably the decrease in international travellers coming back, uh, plus anyone who was sick staying uh, for two weeks in, in isolation, uh, seems to have got rid of flu altogether. Um, so, so that's a great news story. So if your kid is getting, getting the sniffles, it's almost certainly anywhere in Australia, not flu. Uh, so what is it? Um, if it's in Melbourne right now, it's most likely going to be COVID. Uh, and so absolutely, if you're in Melbourne, if you have a sniffle or any mild illness, please get your ch child tested or yourself tested as quickly as possible. That's gonna be extremely important. What about the rest of Australia? Well, there are places where we have seen small community outbreaks uh, in, in certain parts of Sydney uh, and some other parts of New South Wales in uh, South Australia and in Southern Queensland in recent days. Um, so again, very important that we want to find out anyone who has even the most mild of, of symptoms, uh, respiratory symptoms, whether that's COVID or not. So please, yes, get a test. For those other states that are uh, ha have not had cases for some time outside of hotel quarantine, that's probably less important. But again, I think at this stage, we really want to know if, if there are cases appearing in those places. So I'm afraid the answer is, if your kid has a sniffle, get a test. Well, that's uh, one that I'm going to be taking home. And uh, we have been very lucky, as, uh, as Paul said, uh, that the kids haven't had a sniffle uh, this season, which as a parent of three young kids, that is extraordinary. And just testimony to the effect that this has of uh, diminishing respiratory virus transmission, the effectiveness of physical distancing, hand hygiene, and also keeping the kids that are sick away from home and getting them tested. Boss, it's been great to have you on. Uh, glad to have you in my office. Paul's got a nicer office than this one, of course, up there on, on the 14th floor. Uh, but uh, Paul is a, a wonderful person to work for. We've got a, a remarkable team around that I'm learning from every day. I'm very, very proud to be contributing to this. And if there's one message that I can give everybody, when I came in here on March 23rd, uh, when we were in our first wave, the overwhelming sense that I felt was confidence in the response. And that was because of the sheer uh, human resource power People like Paul, people like Brendan, Michael Kidd, uh, amongst many, many others who are working across states and territories and in the Commonwealth to keep us safe. We've got a new challenge with the second wave in Victoria and uh, we're thinking of you all down there. We have the backs of Victorians at the moment and we're working 24 hours a day to get this under control. See you next time.